Good morning and welcome to our, our Bible class. It's good to see everybody out. We have some visitors with us. We're glad to have you. I think we have lots of people out this morning. We're doing wholesale uh, reorg of the service schedule out there this morning. So, so be patient with us this morning as we get everything in order for the, the service with several that we have out. So we'll be continuing this morning in Matthew chapter 26. We'll actually be covering the events uh, of the crucifixion today. So we've got two more lessons in our study of the life of Christ. We'll do the crucifixion this week and then the resurrection, the uh, ascension and the coronation next week. So we're, we're almost done with the quarter. Isn't that amazing? Almost the end of the third quarter already. And, uh, I'm not sure. Is Todd teaching next, Bonnie? You know, is he teaching up here? I know we've got new books, but I'm not sure who the... Is it Todd? Todd's te- Todd will be teaching. And if you get your, go ahead, if there's books up here on the front row for those that are going to be in the Sunday morning class, you want to go ahead and pick one of those up. Uh, all right, so we'll start this morning in Matthew chapter 26. Uh, if you remember last time, we ended uh, with the betrayal and the arrest of Jesus. So, so we saw the events where, where Judas betrayed him, uh, and, and then he, as he was arrested, uh, arrested in the garden. And we ended there in verse, in verse 56 of Matthew chapter 26. Uh, but all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. And, and we talked about this a little bit as we went through our timeline. If you'll, can you advance it? Oh, there it goes. So, you know, now we're, uh, we're at the point of the crucifixion. You know, we, had, we looked at two different timelines about which day it was. But, but in, the, in the order of events, uh, we're, we're about to go through uh, what's listed as Friday on this timeline, the trials and then ultimately the, the, the crucifixion. But remember, with this last sentence here about his disciples fleeing, now we've been discussing this, all the information that's been thrown at them in just the last few days of, of Christ, of him going to die, and the events where they talked about the, the end of the, the Jewish nation and the end of the world, and they were confused about those, and then you know, the establishment of this new covenant, all, all this stuff that, that was thrown at them in just a, a, literally just a few days, and, and now this is occurring. And so sometimes we might say, well, I, well that's not much of them to forsake and, and flee, but you know, you're considering the situation, all the information that has been thrown at them, and now what this, this happening that they didn't expect, right? We've talked about that several times. They didn't expect what was about to happen at, at all. They still didn't get it uh, all the way to the end. So, so you know, we, even though it, it's, it, it's bad in the sense of what they, they did in fleeing, it is understandable in the face of the events that, they, that was going on at this time. So we'll continue this morning then uh, in, in uh, Matthew chapter 26, verse uh, 57. And, and those, I'm sorry, let's start, let's go to John first. Let's get these in the right order. Actually, a little bit happened before here. Let's start in John 18 with a few verses, then we'll come back to Matthew 26. So in John 18, uh, verse, verses 19 uh, to 24. Uh, the, high pri- the high priest uh, then asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in the synagogues and in the temple, where the Jews always meet, and in secret I have said nothing. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. Indeed, they know what I have said. And when he had said these things, one of the officers who stood, who stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his, of his hand, saying, Do you answer the high priest like that? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of, of the evil. But if well, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, uh, the high priest. So then we pick up here in in verse 57 in Matthew uh, chapter 26. And those who had laid hold of Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance to the high priest's courtyard. And he went in and sat with the servants to to see the end. Now the chief priests, the elders, and all the council sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death. But found none. Even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none. But at last two false witnesses came forward and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said to him, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest answered and said to him, 
I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, It is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, Hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need, what further need do we have of witnesses? Look, now you have heard his blasphemy. What do you think? They answered and said, He is deserving of death. Then they spat in his face and beat him, and others struck him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy to us, Christ, who is the one who struck you? So, as we see that this, it's often called these mock trials uh, that are happening. So, the first thing, Jesus was with, with some of the priests themselves, that, that first section from John. And there, you know, they're, they're after him about these things, and what's his response, essentially? It's, it's go ask I hadn't, I hadn't had anything to hide, right? Have I been hiding anything? I've been teaching in the synagogues. I've been teaching here. Go ask the people uh, what I taught. So obviously that wasn't good enough. And then they sent him in to, to, to Caiaphas, the high priest. And now we see them looking for false witnesses. And they finally get the folks to, to show up. And the ones that, what, what was the accusation that, that they pulled from what Jesus had said? What was it Jesus said that gets brought up here? Yeah, that he would say that he would say he would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Now, did Jesus actually say that? He did, right? He, he, who was he talking about? Himself, right? He was talking about himself when he said that. But but he did say that that this was brought in. This was brought in out of context. And in, in verse sixty-one, there that you know they. They say, I put you under oath of the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus didn't deny it. Right? He never has denied it. It is, as you said, and then he actually throws a, judge, a judgment statement at him. You know, Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you'll see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. So what was the final accusation that they finally brought against Jesus to try to get him killed? Francis? Blasphemy. You know, he, he's blasphemed by saying what? That by claiming to be the Son of God. Uh, in, in their eyes, he wasn't. He, he, he affirmed that it is as you said, uh, so they accuse him of, uh, of blasphemy uh, and decide that he, that he is deserving of death. And now we know that this has to continue just in, in the context of where we are. Uh, the Jews were underneath the Romans, and, and the Jews didn't have the power to execute corporal or this kind of punishment, right, of, of a death sentence. They didn't have that authority. So they had to get him in front of the, the Romans to get the Romans to make the decision to actually crucify him. That, that, that had to be from the order of the Romans, not from the Jews, the Jews themselves. So, so that's what we'll see uh, continuing here uh, as we read along. So let's continue in verses 69 to um, uh, 75 here. We see uh, the, the um, actions of Peter. Now Peter sat outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him, saying, You also were with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you are saying. And when he had gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, This fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But again he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. And a little later those who stood by came up and said to Peter, Surely you also are one of them, for your speech betrays you. Then he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus who had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So he went out and wept bitterly. So, so we see uh, J Jesus had prophesied this to Peter, right? But what was Peter's response when Jesus said that? No way. There's no way I'll do that, Lord. I, you know, I'll stand by you, and I'll fight for you, fight to the death for you. But you know, obviously that's, uh, that's not uh, what happened. And, and in, so, in some of the other, I, I didn't, don't remember which one it was, but you're, one of the other passages, didn't, doesn't it say that, that they, they looked at each other? That there was a look between Jesus and Peter after this had happened? Now, can you imagine that as Peter, that, that to have sit here, to have 
sworn up and down that you wouldn't do this. Now you do it, and then there's a look. And, and we see the result of that, that, that he went out and, and wept bitterly. But I ask you the question here, so how could this happen? Norm Pete? Suddenly, the bravado, the, everything they had used to falsely prop up his abilities, all the physical things, fell away. And what was left was not able to hold him. Yeah. I mean, in, in modern context, it was kind of peer pressure, wasn't it? it? These folks were around. He, Like Norm said, he was in an environment where all of a sudden now he's at risk. And people are, well, you were with him. You know, if he's getting arrested, shouldn't you be arrested too? You know, that may have been some of the, the things that people were what we're thinking, and yet he goes through it through all these denials, but but it, it does show us the, the effects of pressure, and, and we we sometimes face that in our in our lives with world for the, especially you know political things that are going on now, you know th things that we may be faced with at work or at school, uh, when we have to make a choice of are we going to stand up or are we going to deny, you know, and, and ho hopefully we'll have the guts to to stand up, but. You know, we, we see here that Peter didn't, but, but at least we, we see that, that he had sorrow for it, and obviously uh, he, he uh, came back, we'll see that next week, so that he didn't make bad decisions as somebody else did that we'll see here in just a second. Sam, did you, did you raise your hand? Okay. All right, let's continue in, verse, in chapter 27, verse 22. Uh, when morning came, all the chief priests and elders of the people plotted against Jesus to put him to death. When they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, uh, the governor. Then skipping down to uh, chapter, uh, verse 11. Now Jesus stood before the governor, uh, and the governor asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said to him, uh, It is as you say. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then Pilate said to him, You do not hear how many things they testify against you? But he answered, he answered him not a word so that the governor marveled greatly. And then let's flip over to John, look at the passage there in John 18. In John 18, uh, 28 to 38. Uh, then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium, and it was early morning, but they themselves did not go into the praetorium, lest they should be defiled, but, but, but that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not an evildoer, would, we would not have delivered him up to you. Then Pilate said to them, You take him and judge him according to your law. Therefore the Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, uh, which he spoke signifying by what death he would die. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, him, are you, Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for yourself about this, or did others tell you this concerning me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What ha have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight, so that I, sh so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? When he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. Uh, so so we, we see Jesus, uh, again, is he denying anything before Pilate? Oh, he, he says that he's the Son of God, that, that he's the, the, the king of 
uh, of the Jews and in, in detail. Uh, he, he actually goes into an explanation of what Norm just brought up. What, what's the characteristics of his kingdom? Jesus' kingdom. Yeah, not here, not of this world. If it were, what would his servants do? They would fight. Right? They would stand up and fight against the Jews physically. And we saw that, you know, that that's not, that that's not uh, what, what happened. And what, what couple of things surprised Pilate? First, Francis. Yeah, he didn't defend himself, for one thing. And then what about the, the, the accusations themselves? What did Pilate think of them? Chris is shaking her head. Not much. He couldn't find anything wrong with him. Right? That they, you're bringing this guy here. You want me to put him to death, and, and I'm not finding any reason to. It's, it's, his, conclusion. it's his conclusion for that. So, so here's Pilate. Yeah, he's, he's left with Jesus, who's claiming to be this king of this different kingdom, and he's not really defending himself. The Jews want him put, put to death, but Pilate can't find anything wrong with him, so what's he going to do? So, so he has to make a decision about, uh, about what to, to, to do next. But we're going to back up just a second before we move into that. In, back up in, in verse 3 uh, of chapter 27, talking about Judas. Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been con condemned, was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? You see to it. Then he threw down the 30 pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. But the chief priests took the silver and said, It is not lawful to put them into the treasury because they are the price of blood. And they consulted together and, and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Therefore, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, And they took thirty pieces of silver, silver the value of him who was pierced, whom, whom they of the children of Israel priced, and gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord directed me. Uh, so, so we see the, the, the end of Judas here. What realization came to him? That this was really happening, essentially? You know, he's seeing that he had been condemned was remorseful. You know, we, we don't know what his whole thought process was. You know, we, we do know that money was very important to him, and he went through the, this process of, of selling out Jesus. But, but you know, whether he expected a miracle or, or something that this would never really happen, Clarissa? Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that on, on what the Jews think. The blame game that he was winning them over the last few days, the Jews He may not have, he, he obviously sinned and did wrong, but it may be, yeah, he didn't realize it was going to go that far. He thought something, Jesus could do something. I don't know. He yeah. just didn't understand. He may not have completely understood. And then when it was turning out to how it was, how it was supposed to go, even though he told him how it was supposed to go, he probably couldn't believe it. Yeah, and go ahead, Jim. I was going to say, it seems like. Maybe his thought process was they've been trying to get Jesus for a long time and he always slips out from them when they try to get him or, or whatever. So, I mean, he's like, this could be the same as any other time and he didn't use the stuff that Jesus already told him was going to happen, like where that's what he's saying. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, and we, whether, obviously we can't relate exactly what Judas went through, but, but yeah, have you ever gotten a situation where it just went too far and you're like, uh-oh, why did I even get this? Why did I even start this? It might not even be something bad, yeah, but you get in, you know, how did this get start over here and get all the way to here? Yeah, we see this, but what was the final mistake that Judas made? Francis? Yeah, he went and killed himself. I mean, and, and really, was what Judas did any worse than what Peter did? Seeing sin, right? He betrayed him, Peter denied him. But we see a completely difference in, in the, the reaction to it, right? Both, even both were remorseful. We see he was remorseful here. Obviously, Peter was. But we know Peter repented and came back to Christ, where, where Judas made the wrong decision, uh, wrong decision 
uh, not to. And it, it should have led him to repentance, not to the, the decision that, that he made to, to kill himself. Norm Pete. Can, can we out sin grace? No. As long as, long as we're willing to, to come back and ask for forgiveness. All right, let's flip over to Luke 23. We'll see where Pilate sent Jesus. So Luke 23, 6 through 12. Luke 23, and verse, beginning in verse 6. Uh, when Pilate heard of, the, of, Gal, of Galilee, he asked if the man were a Galilean. As soon as he knew that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. Now when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad, for he had desired for a long time to see him because he had heard many things about him and hoped to see some miracle done by him. Then he questioned him with many words, but he answered him nothing. And the chief priests and scribes stood and vehemently accused him. Then Herod, then Herod with his men of war, treated him with contempt and mocked him, arrayed him in a gorgeous robe, and sent him back to Pilate. That very day, Pilate and Herod became friends with each other, for previously they had been at, at enmity uh, with each other. So Jesus sends him now uh, to Herod. What did Herod want? He, want? he wanted a show, didn't he? All right, Jesus is coming. Maybe he'll do a miracle. Yeah, and it's kind of, a, you know, we, we think about temptation here. But what do you think would have happened if Jesus had done a miracle? He brought Terry to let him go, wouldn't he? Uh, you know, yeah, so again, it's th this all in Jesus being willing to fulfill uh, God's will in all this and, and, not, be, and not succumb to, to, uh, to doing something that, that, he shouldn't, that, that he shouldn't have done that was not in, according to the will, the will of God. That, that's what he wanted. He wanted to show, but obviously he kind of was coming to the same conclusion. That, but the Jews were getting rowdy. So it, it's kind of interesting. He's claiming to be a king, so how does Herod dress him up? Puts, that, puts this, this fancy robe on him, right? Puts this fancy robe on him, sends him back, uh, sends him back to, uh, uh, to uh, Pilate. <coughs> it's for, but, but it's kind of interesting in it there at the end. Uh, what happened between those two? They became buddies. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Well, don't we see this in our political climate a lot? It, yeah, it, it, there, you can have enemies become friends if they have a common enemy. Yeah, it's kind of the same situation here. That, that they're, all, they're caught up in this deal with Jesus and the Jews, and now they're having to deal, it, deal with it together. And, and all of a sudden, they're, uh, they become buddies, uh, buddies about it. All right, let's turn back then to Matthew. In Matthew chapter 27, we'll begin in verse... Uh, 15 Matthew 27 15 now at the feast of the goat at the feast the governor was accustomed to release into the multitude one prisoner whom they wished and at that time they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas therefore when they when they had gathered together Pilate said to him whom do you want me to release to you Barabbas or Jesus who is called Christ but but for he knew that they had that they had handed him over because of envy while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent to him, saying, Have nothing to do with that just man, for I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release to you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, What then shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said to him, Let him be crucified. Then the governor said, uh, why? What evil has he has he done? But they crucif but they cried out all the more, saying, "Let him be crucified." When Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, "I am innocent of the blood of this person. You see to it." And all the people answered and said, "His blood be on us and on our children." Then he then he released Barabbas to them. When they had 
scourged Jesus, he delivered him uh, to, be, to be crucified. So, so what, what, what does Pilate, he come, Pilate, maybe he thought he had a little bit of a plan here. It seems like, doesn't it? Well, let's see, I'll offer him this really bad guy or Jesus. And, and do, do you think he expected them to stay on Jesus? I don't know if he did or not, but, but at least he, he gave him a shot. <laughs> he gave him a shot anyway. Uh, but obviously, uh, they didn't take it, and that they, were, they were bent on getting Jesus, Jesus crucified. And, you know, and, and verse 25 is really a serious verse, isn't it? And all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and on our children. And, and you think about that actually happened uh, in the destruction that was coming uh, the, physically, the, the, destru- the destruction that was coming to, uh, to Jerusalem, in, I guess it would have been 30 to 40 years from uh, the time of, uh, of, these, of these events. Uh, but you know, th- they were bent on, on the crucifixion of Jesus, and at this point, Pilate just said what? Come on, P. Envy, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, the, the Jews were they were so corrupt in what they were doing, they would have they would rather kill someone who they knew was innocent. And, and it ultimately it came down to Pilate, what was his decision? I either crucify Jesus or have a big uproar on my hands. Uh, and he just said, right, wash my hands, his blood's on you, and then send him, uh, send him on his way uh, to, be, to be delivered him to be crucified. All right, so continuing in verse 27, uh, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and, and gathered the whole garrison around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. When they, when they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And, and, when, they had mocked, and when they had mocked him, they took the robe off him, put his clothes, put his clothes on him, and led him away uh, to be uh, crucified. So, so we see this, this mocking from the soldiers. You, you know, at, at this point, you, you kind of had mob mentality going, right, from, from the Jews. You know, you've got these folks in power here as the Romans, and you know, I would, you hate to say it, but they were just having some fun with Jesus, wasn't they? Uh, as far as just pushing their, the power that they had and beating him, putting the, the robe on him, the crown on his head and all that. And, it, and it's interesting, in one of the versions I read there in verse 31, in the New King James it just said when they had mocked him. In the one I read it said when they finally tired of mocking him. And I thought that's an interesting way to think about it. You know, they just kind of did this till they got tired of it. Uh, we, we just mock him, beat him, smack him around till they said, ah, let's, we, let's go do something else. It's kinda, it's, it shows you know, their, their disregard or they didn't have any knowledge of who Jesus, Jesus was. And you know, it, it doesn't say a lot here, but we, we talk about it sometimes that you know, he had been scourged. Remember what a scourging is? That rips, essentially rips your skin up. Now they've taken his clothes off, put this robe on him. Then they rip the robe off, put his clothes back. The, the, the pain that Jesus was under at this point, as we, we've discussed, is that sometimes people died before the crucifixion because of the, the, the things they had to endure just to get, just to, get to the, the cross. So, so, so we see this, and now we, uh, we'll continue here in verse uh, in verse 32, in verse 32 of Matthew 27. Now as they came out, they found a, a, a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they had come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of the skull, they gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink. But when he had tasted it, he would not drink. Then they crucified him and divided his garments, his garments casting lot, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, 
They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Sitting down, they kept watch over him there. And they put up over his head the accusation written against him, This is Jesus, king, this is Jesus the king of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and another on the left. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, You who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priest also, mocking with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now, if, if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. Even the robbers who were crucified him reviled him with the, the same thing. You know, when we see this, it's interesting, isn't it? Verse 35 is very quick. Then they crucified him. Uh, we know that wasn't a quick process, to be literally nailed to a cross. And, and, and what that must have entailed, it, it just kind of me, anyway, it makes me squeamish just to even th to think about, to think about the physical or what that puts somebody through physically. And then you know, we've talked about when people go through this, when you're up on the cross, you're having to push up to keep breathing, the, the, the physical suffering is, is incredible uh, in this form, of, uh, this form of death that the Romans had, had come up with. And, and so they, you know, they, they put the sign over his head. In one of the other, the, the other passages, the Jews didn't want that, right? But you know, they said, hey, we're going we're to put this, the sign. He's the king of the Jews uh, on, there as well. You know, what, what, I ask you the question here in verse 8. So, so what do you think here was the ultimate insult? From the Jews. Verses 42 and 43. Yeah, he saved others. If, if he is the king of the Jews, let him come down now from the cross and we'll believe him. Yeah, right. But uh, yeah, that, that's, and, and you know, I thought about in how that relates to, let, let's turn over to Hebrews 10. Now, Hebrews 10, uh, verses 26 to 31. It says, For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much more punishment do you suppose that will be brought, but will, will be thought worthy, who, uh, excuse me, will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord, and again the Lord will judge his people. Now, th this is serious business in, in, in the fact that obviously they're mocking Jesus, they're mocking the Son of God, they're, they refuse to believe him, which, which puts them in a state of condemnation uh, j just because of that. And this whole, this, this attitude of just willful sin, which we have to be careful of as well. That, that passage in Hebrews is, is similar in, in, in the warnings that are there. You know, if we turn to sin and are, are unwilling to, to repent, that we are essentially doing the same thing they did here. That we're mocking Christ. We're mocking the covenant that's been made. And that's a serious thing as it ends up. Who gets the ultimate vengeance? God, right? And it's a, it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God, as it says elsewhere. Yeah, but you think about here, you know, as God, this had to be a hard moment. Your son's on the cross, then these folks are behaving this way, and it's got to it's got to finish. Right, now we know ultimately the Jewish nation is going to pay for, for what uh, for what they for the, the the actions they've had with Jesus as well as the other prophets and ultimately their destruction. But to let this be carried out uh, is a tough to me had to be a, a tough thing. Norm Norm P. What would an all powerful being watching his creation do this to his own son? When it says that there's a terrifying expectation. And God is the one that says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. When that being, the, the all-powerful one, is the one that's going to be vengeance upon you, for what you did, 
his son should put a whole new level of urgency on what am I doing right now that would put me in his path? Because that's where everyone in the world stood when this event took place. That's where everyone in the world stands now. Yeah. That, 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 that terrifying expectation is meant to keep people who are not willing to love God at least in line. Mm -hmm. but ultimately, there's vengeance from God. All right, in verse 45. Now from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, there was darkness all over the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, uh, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood there when they heard that said, This man is calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran up and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and offered it to him uh, to drink. Offered it, offered it to him uh, to drink. Uh, <clears throat> the, the rest said, Let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come and save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up uh, his spirit. So I ask you the question here, uh, how does Jesus uh, identify with prophecy? Where does this statement come from? He makes here. Psalm 22. You know, and Jesus is identifying himself well, with the statements that are, that are made in Psalm 22, which are obviously uh, a prophecy, uh, a prophecy of the Messiah. You know, we see a, a few other statements that he made. He, I trust my spirit in your hands. And in the other passage, uh, it is finished. But with what, 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 how it concludes in the John. So, so we see here. Uh, Jesus making these statements. But what what did they mean? When Jesus said it is finished. What do you mean? All the prophecies have been fulfilled. Yeah, the, the work of the cross is finished. Uh, what, what he his the sacrifice uh, the sacrifice uh, is done, and uh, that he's done he's completed his Father's will. Hadn't he? And it, it's interesting, you know, we hear in Matthew or in the other verse he said. It really just says that he gave up his spirit. He said, I trust my spirit into your hands. You know, I've done your will. I've, I've died on the cross. And now my spirit is in your hands for what's, for what's about to happen. What's about to happen next. All right, continuing in verse 51. Uh, then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earthquake and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves, after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So when the centurion and those with him who regarded Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, Truly this man was the Son of God. And many women who followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, were, were there looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. So, so we see these things happening, Christ's death, the, the temple being torn, earthquakes, you know, rock split, tombs open, resurrected folks running around Jerusalem, appearing to people. And it is interesting, again, who picked up on this? The soldiers. The soldiers. You'd think the, Jew, the Jews should have been the ones picking up on this. Right, especially some of the stuff in the, the temple, and then you know, the, the folks that were, were coming out of the graves. But you know, at, at this point, it was that their their minds were set in it of who he was, and he got what he deserved, and they're they're out celebrating at this point, more likely uh, that Jesus that, that Jesus is now is now died uh, on the cross. So we'll continue in verse. Um, let's see, fifty seven. Uh, now when evening had come, there was a rich man of Ar uh, man from Arimathea named Joseph, uh, who himself had also been a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. The Pilate commanded the body to be given to him. When Jesus had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his new tomb, which he had hewn out of a rock. And he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. And Mary Magdalene was there, and the other Mary sitting, sitting opposite uh, the tomb. So, so we see how Jesus' uh, body was cared for, uh, cared for in, uh, in his death. Uh, and this was a prophecy, right, from, from Isaiah 53. In Isaiah 53, uh, verse 9, we see uh, the prophecy uh, that Jesus would be buried among whom? The rich. Right? He would be buried among the rich. And we see that happen from uh, here when he was taken into, 
into the tomb uh, of Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea. So, so we sit here now, and we're going to end up in, in verses 61 to 60, or 62 to 66. On the next day, which followed, the day of the preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered, to, gathered together to Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember while he was still alive how that deceiver said, After three days I will rise. Therefore command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away, and say to the people, He has risen from the dead, so that the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard, go your way, make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone uh, and setting and setting the guard. Now, for those of you who are here, uh, Todd just preached on this, so we all know the answer to this last question here. So, so they ask for this guard, and I ask, why is this important even today? What's the significance of having the guard at the tomb and it all sealed up? And all, why, why does that matter to us? Yeah. Norm P. And they were there to prevent him from just taking it. So it, it, it's a whole matter of if, if he has, if he wasn't raised, he should be able to prove his body. And Jews couldn't do it because he was raised. Yeah, and it's interesting that it does show that they were listening. Right, <laughs> they had listened to Jesus, and they recognized he said he was going to rise from the dead. So that they wanted this that uh, that grave sealed up tight, didn't they? Sealed up, guarded. Because they didn't want they didn't want his disciples to be able to come steal the body and then say, look, look, he, he's risen. And, and you know, it also does away with if you've heard of the swoon theory, you know that Jesus really didn't die on the cross. He was just kind of unconscious, but he woke back up in the tomb and got out. And, you know, these kind of things obviously are, are are excuses to try to get around the resurrection. But but as Todd pointed out in in his sermon, you know, this is a a faith builder for us, right? That when we consider, we have to make a decision. Is this is this really true? That, I mean, we, we just read spent forty five minutes reading scripture. Is, is all this stuff true, or is this just a fanciful story? Well, well, this is evidence, right? That this is evidence that that what that this is true. It gives us a basis for our, our faith, as Todd taught us in his in his sermon. All right. Well, thank you. We made it through that one. And we'll have one more, one more long lesson to get through next week for the, the resurrection and, and all that. Uh, the questions will be out there uh, after class if you want to pick one of those up. And we will conclude our study next Sunday morning. Thank you.